So I'm Chris Clements with uh, University of California, Davis. I'm Jamie Butler at UC Davis as well, but I work in the College of Engineering. And I manage the Network Operations Center for the campus. Uh, not to be confused with the Med Center, they, we kind of run a little bit separately. So for the core campus, I run their Network Operations Center. Great, so uh, this is Next Generation Firewalls, uh, kind of a proof of concept and new architecture for UC Davis. Hopefully you're in the right room. All right. Uh, so just to give you a little background, this is largely a talk about a, uh, a pilot and then proof of concept for the next generation of what the UC Davis campus architecture could be for the network. Uh, and I took a job uh, about a year ago as the uh, IT director for the College of Engineering and encountered uh, what you would expect at an educational institution with, uh, let's say, varying levels of IT support across the organization. Um, so lots of problems that we'll go into in a second, but it was uh, an area ripe with opportunity for change uh, and was really a kind of a blank slate for how we could look at technology and security for the college. And from a campus perspective, um, we've had for a number of years a program where each individual department is responsible for protecting their own network or their own subnet. So we had started uh, a program several years back where there was core campus funds allocated <coughs> to helping departments get off the ground, buy a firewall, um, even some help and support of getting them configured properly. And over the time, that's generally kind of eroded to the fact where that money is now really no longer there. People in those departments have moved, changed jobs, done other things, and uh, firewall admins in the past have you know, forgotten passwords, trimmed down rule sets to some degree to where maybe they're not even doing what it is that the campus wanted them to do. So the, the College of Engineering is a really good kind of uh, model of, of the overall climate uh, at UC Davis and, and what we're facing. So uh, when, I, when I took over, we, we largely occupy four buildings on campus and then have a number of satellite locations. So we are all kind of spread out. Uh, there was eight different departments, uh, each had their own IT staff. So there was eight different ways of doing network security, um, IT support in general. Uh, and really the reason I got hired there was to bring all of that together into one shop, to consolidate IT across the college, get some economies of scale, and create some consistency and really make it a bit more professional than it had been in the past. Um, so this is kind of where we're at, we were at uh, about a year ago. From the campus perspective, the College of Engineering, just to put a scope on it, um, traffic-wise, they amount to about one-third of the traffic going across my network at any given time. So while they're only occupying four buildings, I say only, um, they actually do amount to quite a bit of the actual data flowing across the network. So it's a really large institution on, on the network footprint. So uh, as you can imagine, we kind of alluded to, we had a slew of problems, and we'll kind of walk you through uh, each one of them individually. Uh, so just overall security was an issue. Uh, you know, I said before, we had eight different departments. Uh, across those eight departments, there's about 42 or 44 different VLANs, network segments. Um, I think there were three firewalls. So uh, a lot of these networks were public IP space, wide open to the entire world. Some systems may have had host-based firewalls, may not have. Uh, I think a couple of the firewalls that were in place actually had rule sets that said allow any, any. Um, so they were compliant because they had firewalls, but obviously the practice was really poor. Um, so just increasing the pr network security was a big issue for us. Um, yeah, and again, from a campus perspective, security is you know a huge factor, it's something that um, 
network nodes on the campus is something, you know, it's a, it's a very large number of devices that are actually publicly addre addressed. Um, and we'll talk to you in a minute. But um, overall, you know, as, that, as the project I alluded to in the beginning kind of erodes, the, the vulnerability of those machines starts going up kind of proportional to the decrease in the funds. The other thing I didn't mention is you know, we have a large research uh, component to the college, so there's lots of instrumentation uh, on the network that requires computers. And if you're familiar at all with that use case, uh, a lot of these are Windows XP, Windows 95 workstations that can't be patched because patching the workstation breaks its functionality. It's controlling a million dollar microscope. And so the vendor doesn't supply updates for it. That's a huge issue. Um, and so we have to protect those things, but still maintain their operations. <clears throat> uh, another big thing uh, for the campus as a whole is uh, we have two Class B subnets for the campus. Uh, and as I said, a lot of the devices are on public IP space. So uh, as we start bringing in uh, a lot of these devices, every single student shows up with 15 devices on them at every given time. Uh, IPv, you know, our public IP space is going away, uh, and we're getting to a point where we're actually exhausting our, our space. Yeah, we could do a whole other presentation just on the IPv4 to v6 work and natting and all of that stuff. But for the purposes of the firewall stuff, it, it really um, you'll see later why why that's important for this talk. But what Jamie says is absolutely true. You know, we started off with two slash 16s. Um, when, when a department comes to us and says we need a new subnet, we basically just carve off the next available block, give it to them, they firewall it. Well, that's all public, public routable IPs. Um, from Jamie's perspective in the, the School of Engineering, that's 42 VLANs that they have. So um, 42 different subnets uh, eating up our IPv4 space. In most cases, if it's a contained network segment, you know, do those really need to be publicly routable? So we'll get into some of that a little bit later. Yeah, there's lots of printers that are just sitting on public IP space for no other reason than that's the way they've always done it. It was always a luxury, right? When, when you have plenty, it's easy to hand it out. Now that we don't have plenty, it's hard to get it back. Uh, one of the other issues we, we encounter a lot is, you know, what are people doing? We don't know the traffic that's cr crossing our network. We don't know who it is. Uh, we have lots and lots of violation re uh, reports coming through because people are file sharing doing peer-to-peer -peer sharing, uh, doing naughty things in the network. We've got lots of students who just show up with their own devices and start uh, lighting up BitTorrent and whatever. Uh, and so we had to spend a lot of uh, IT staff time tracking down these violators and getting their content off the network so that we're not liable. Uh, and it's, it's a real time sink. Yeah, one of the, one of the largest, I, I would say, um, identity problems that we have is really boils down to DMCA violations, which is the, the RECA, you know, digital media tracking and, and stopping of file sharing. So um, when we get those, you know, we're a safe haven status university, so when we get a request to, to find and locate the individual that's, that's doing this file sharing, um, it's important that we exactly timestamp the, the RECA or DMCA notification time with the actual user that was given that IP address at, on the network at that time. So for things like wireless and our residential networks, that becomes a big problem, more so than the departments. Um, but the departments do occasionally get these notices from time to time. So not only knowing what machine was on the network, but the user that was behind that activity. So um, we can provide that information back to the appropriate sources. Uh, this is an exaggeration, but probably not much of an exaggeration. Uh, and it's really meant to talk about two things. One is uh, our wiring closets in the, the college were pretty atrocious. For, for years it was, oh, um, we need to put a new computer in that corner. And so somebody would show up and run a patch cable or get a box out and run in, in a piece. And over time, the wiring closets got to be pretty atrocious. Uh, but the other thing this really is meant to talk about is, uh, is VLAN sprawl, layer two sprawl across campus. Um, we're doing a lot of, because of the way networking has kind of grown up organically over time, uh, we have a layer two segment that might span four areas of the campus. So we're, we're routing that, or not routing, but we're actually moving that layer two traffic uh, up through area routers and across the campus core. 
Uh, so when somebody does something silly like create a network loop in one building, it takes a building halfway across campus down. Um, or uh, broadcast traffic is having to traverse the core for no real reason. And a lot of that is just historical. You know, we had, there was lots of technology 15 years ago, 20 years ago, that didn't like being routed, that really wanted layer two adjacency. And that's not really the case anymore. Most things play well on a routed IP network. Um, so the idea here is to limit and get rid of some of those um, issues by reducing layer two sprawl. Yeah, we have a, a general rule of thumb within the Network Operations Center that there's a, it's a three by three rule. Every, every department has three buildings that they're present in and every building has at least three departments in it. So when you look at that from a layer two perspective, you've got VLANs crossing over each other going from building A to B. You've got departments that are spread out all over the place, in some cases maybe not even on campus, um, that we transmit over you know, leased lines to, to a remote facility. So as Jamie indicates, you know, when you have one bridge loop or one network problem that, that causes uh, an issue, especially layer two, um, it, the, the impact to that is huge. You know, that, that can really cripple the network very quickly. So you know, that, that's one of the issues, uh, layer two. It's uh, definitely a big problem of ours right now. Um, and last is just that we had no visibility of what was actually happening on the network. Um, you know, a lot of the node firewalls, nothing inspecting the traffic, so we had no idea what was going on. Um, and I think for a lot of years, people just turned a blind eye to it and said, well, what we don't know won't kill us. Um, and we wanted to take a different approach. Yeah, and I think that goes to the, you know, when the, when the firewall project first started and was funded by core funds, um, you had a lot of ownership. You know, there was people that, it was a new project, people had a lot of excitement about it. They were hiring people to run their department firewalls. Um, the, the actual department itself was, was really supportive of the decision to do that. And, and slowly as things change, their focuses change as well. And so now you get to a point where the firewall is, is a problem more so than a convenience or something that's helping them. And so it's easier to say, well, let's just put an exception in and, and not have to deal with that than to really find out why was that rule there in the first place, what was it protecting us from, and how do we keep that protection but still allow somebody, a researcher or a faculty, to do what they need to do. It's just so much easier to say, forget it, I'll just accept it out and we'll just go on. So we really wanted to identify from a core campus where are those vulnerabilities, what is the visibility into the network, what does the traffic look like, so that we can classify it and say, you know, we want to accept it here, but we don't want to accept it there. So that kind of frameworks the, the problems that we were dealing with um, prior to the, this proof of concept. And um, as we go forward in the presentation, you'll see you know, what our goals were um, and then basically where we are. So under the goals. Um, so about a year ago, I came to Chris with all these problems and the two of us sat down and said, okay, well, we have an opportunity to do things the way we've been doing them, uh, make it incrementally better, or we can stop and rethink and re-engineer how we're doing things, not just for the College of Engineering, but for the entire campus. So we took the opportunity to, instead of putting in today's tech, you know, yesterday's technology today, to think kind of into the future about how we could really make things better. Um, especially since, as we all know, uh, money only comes around every so often, so we wanted to take uh, advantage of it as much as possible, knowing we weren't going to be making investments in infrastructure like this next year. Right. Yeah, uh, it's, a, it's a rather large undertaking when you look at it from a full campus perspective. I mean, it's, it's a lot easier to, to maybe find some seed money and say, okay, everybody go buy a firewall. These are the general things that you want to do. When you try to re rein that back in and say, now this is going to be a centrally managed project from a core campus perspective, um, the dollar figures and the, the, the scope of that project becomes very, very large very quickly, as you can imagine. So when we were looking at um, the consistency model, that's exactly um, what the key was in mind. So um, how can we basically treat every department the same? How can we have like infrastructure doing what it is that it needs to do and yet provide the individual departments with the autonomy to be able to work their independent department the way they need to? 
Uh, again, trying to address the IPv6 exhaustion uh, and for research, IPv, sorry, IPv4 exhaustion, IPv6 not only gives us a much larger uh, pool of addresses, but it's almost required for research. And I'm not sure how many people in the room are doing research, uh, but a lot of Asian countries are only, or researchers in Asian countries are only using IPv6. Uh, so we're, we have to either do some kind of address translation or route native six for our folks to be able to communicate and work together. Uh, so this was really a big issue for us, wanting to make sure that you know, we're, we're again, we're the next generation of our network is gonna be ready for the needs of our users, not just today, but into the future. Uh, one of the other core, core goals was to introduce application layer visibility, uh, knowing that, uh, you know, it's great that we can block port 80, but everything is going across port 80 now. Um, so we really wanted to open up web traffic, but we instead opened up Skype, and now we opened up uh, everything else, BitTorrent, because applications are getting smart enough to route over port 80 or 443. Um, so having that application layer visibility and to be able to write policies on that was really important. Yeah, absolutely, and that goes back to you know, one of the original problems of when you, when you have your departmental firewall and you lock it down in the beginning, everything sounds great from a security perspective, but then as people start coming to you and saying, well, my application is no longer working because it's being blocked by the firewall, you start making exceptions, you start poking holes on a, on a strictly IP and port base. Um, it's not very predictive to say, if I block this port, what's gonna break or not break? So it becomes important to understand from a firewall perspective, what exactly is going on? What, what protocols are being used? What application is trying to access that protocol? And do I block it or not block it, as opposed to a strict port and IP? I mean, even to give you a concrete example of that, uh, you know, we're trying to reduce our IT staff and the management that we need to do for all of these services. And if anyone in here has managed a firewall, you've, always, you've inevitably gotten the request, oh, can you please open up port 8080? Uh, port 8089, I got that one now too. Or uh, how about 8081? And you're fielding all of these requests for the next port that somebody decided to throw a web server on. Um, so having that visibility, understanding what the traffic is, allows you to write different types of rules. Uh, introducing a VPN. Uh, most of our users were, because we either didn't have firewalls or we all have publicly addressable IP space, are used to connecting directly to their machine and getting access to the services on their local desktop. And uh, we wanted to prevent all that. We wanted to pre keep all of the traffic, maybe put people on private and added space, um, but still provide them the access, the methods to get back into the resources they wanted. So building a VPN into the solution was very important. And from a campus perspective, we've had VPN services for quite a while. Um, it was a service that was really you know, low to adopt. Um, departments basically had to have somebody uh, familiar with the technology, familiar with the application, and grant individual users the, the privilege or the right to be able to use that. So, um, you know, at the, at the demise of the, the traditional modem pool, um, connecting back to the campus was a little bit challenging. So when we looked at it from Jamie's perspective, sorry about that, um, let me move this down. There we go. Is that better? So when we, when we looked at it from a campus perspective and, and looking at it from um, what Jamie's needs were, it was very clear that we needed to look at VPN and remote access as part of this core product and this core overhauling of uh, what we're going to do with firewalling, knowing that that's kind of a natural place to allow or not allow access. So uh, one of the goals, again, was just to fold that into this, this whole project. Uh, another thing was keep it simple, the simple button. Uh, a lot of this was about staff time. I had no dedicated staff in my group that was just doing this. Uh, because we were in the process of a reorganization, this fell to me, largely to manage and to make sure that the policies were in place. And until we could staff up, um, it would be difficult to make sure that this was operational. Not to mention we wanted to have uh, to develop this as a pilot so that it could be leveraged across the campus. And we don't have 
dedicated security people in every single department managing these things. So we wanted to put something in place that was very simple to use, very simple to operate, intuitive, um, and really a monkey such as myself could, could do it. So one of, the, one of the large challenges is as we again, we talk back to the original foundation of, of our project, which was the seed money that funded people to go out and buy their own firewalls and manage them in, uh, individually. Um, it, it's important to look at the op opposite of simple, and that was complicated. And that's where we are. We are at a complicated model. We have not a standardized vendor. We have people doing software firewalls, appliance firewalls. Um, each individual, even within one department, you could have multiple firewalls of different vendors. Um, each firewall or each instance typically has its own login. So now when you want a department that's spanning three buildings or uh, even more, and there's firewalls at multiple locations within their networks, now an admin, a firewall admin, has to log in to each individual firewall, make a change, go into another one, make the same change, because they're probably on different appliances or, or, or software instances. So when we looked at the overall goals of this project, we wanted to, to streamline that and say, it shouldn't matter whether uh, you're in this building, that building, if you're this department or you're that department, we want it to be the same interface. We want it to be the same user experience, and we want them to be able to log in, make a change, and log out, and not have to think too much about exactly what everything is going to have to be, which box am I on, which network is that protecting. It's just a common rule set that they can log in, do what they need to do, log out, and move on with their business. Uh, this one's just very simple, but increasing the overall level of security. Um, now again, having nothing in place, we, we could have thrown darts at the wall and been better off, but uh, really the idea here is that we wanted to provide a comprehensive solution that increased our, our level of security across everything. And that's, when we look at the original project, again, it was, here's the firewalls, go out, um, here's what we recommend. But um, one thing that we, we've kind of lacked over the, the period of time is the, the recommendations of what those basic rule sets look like. So when we go out and say, here is a firewall, go put it on your network and make sure you're protected, there really isn't a subset to that that says, by doing this and by blocking these ports or by using this known data and applying that towards your network. So what we wanted to do is, as, a, as a goal is take that data that we know, look at things that are happening as a holistic approach, Maybe some of it is, is data from, from other vendors, other manufacturers, other universities, and actually use that, that data that's available to us and say, this is what everybody should be doing as a basic foundation. So if you have a firewall, if you have a department network, these are the basic things that we want you to protect yourself against and provide that core foundation. And then really trying to figure out who people are on the network, what the traffic is, tying individual packets of traffic to a person so that we can allow some things, deny other things based on who you are on the network, not just what the traffic is. Yeah, so tying back to the, the IPv4 discussion that we had um, in the goals, when we look at the average user, what we're seeing right now is about three to one user to device IP consumption. So you have an iPhone or you know, some sort of, of smart mobile phone. You've got uh, a tablet or you know, some kind of an e-reader or something like that. And then you've got a laptop or a, a physical machine. So it's pretty easy to see the three to one ratio. Um, from an operations perspective, my, my take on this has always been just because I run the Network Operations Center doesn't necessarily mean that when I log onto the network with my iPhone that I should be given the ability to log into the core router and make routing statement changes. That's, that's a little bit broad stroke, but you can see the point. <coughs> I need to know not only who I am, but what device am I accessing the network with. And based on the combination of those items, allow or don't allow access. And do it dynamically. I don't want to have to sit here and create rules for 40,000 staff or faculty that say, with this combination of this and that, do this. It needs to be something that's dynamic, and then it needs to be something that takes the individual user identity and the identity of the machine that they're accessing the network, put them together, and then perform logic based on that combination. 
So that was really the overall goals of the project. Um, so we'll talk some, a little bit about the individual technology for next gen and then go into the actual architecture of what we put together. Um, so uh, again, just the application layer visibility, moving away from the typical IP port protocol version of rule sets uh, and adding the application la actual application layer visibility as well as the user identity. And so now being able to create policies that can use any of those as metrics um, for allowing or denying traffic. Uh, so we don't ha necessarily have to use all of them, but it does give us an additional tools in the arsenal from our building our complex rule sets. Yeah, I think it should be noted that the goal wasn't to just strictly swing the gate and say, okay, now we're gonna do everything based on, on identity. We still do need the ability to block known bad ports or known bad protocols. Um, so we don't wanna lose that. Doing everything we can to block viruses at the network layer before they come in. Um, we got a lot of people pulling things off of websites coming through. It's just another attack vector we can try to get a handle on um, before the content arrives at the end user de computing device. And this was something that, when I hired on with UC Davis, kind of always baffled my mind. You know, we have we have a high bandwidth internet connection to our regional provider, and it always seems strange to me that if if we're allowing that pipe to come into our campus network and we have all of this infrastructure between our border and the end user and we know there's bad traffic going through there, why aren't we doing anything about that? Why are we letting it get all the way down to the end user and in some cases the actual end user's device before we say, oh wait, that was bad. We shouldn't have let that through or you shouldn't be clicking on that or you shouldn't be uh, <coughs> allowing that machine to talk to this machine. So it really kind of was a strange approach. I came from a very strict corporate environment and that's what they did. They blocked everything in most cases outbound and inbound and said this is what you're allowed to do while you're on this network. So coming to a more open environment, um, it was a very strange mind shift change for me. So as a um, enhancement to this firewall project, that's one of the things that we're gonna try to implement is doing more central blocking, doing more central virus protection and, and the firewalling in general. Uh, this is a cartoon and kind of complicated, but the, the goal is the yes, no. So again, making management so simple and easy that anybody can do it. And I was the test because if I can figure it out, then anybody else could. Um, so we really wanted to have something that was, was almost, it, you know, step-by-step -step instructions through some kind of a GUI or management interface that uh, made it very easy, very repeatable um, to understand what was happening on the network, not only from the creating rule sets, but from consuming and reporting and doing the analysis after the fact to understand the, the data trends. That we wanted something that was very easy to use that could deploy uh, rules across multiple firewalls, uh, multiple systems, and make it very, very um, simple to do. So that was probably the second thing that was most shocking to me in, in coming to UC Davis was we have individual departments that are specialized in the research that they're doing. Uh, college of Engineering is a perfect example. I mean, the, the grant money and the research dollars that go into that college are, are you know, very large amounts of money. Yet they have to employ an IT staff to do things like manage a firewall so that they can protect their internal research and network. To me, that's a really strange model. To me, if you have a core service that's, that's providing data connectivity to somebody, and you have a choke point of where all that data is going to funnel to go out to the outside world, then why aren't we doing more at that level? Why aren't we making it um, either a policy or, or something that's a yes, no checkbox for the end user, instead of having to manage, buy equipment, manage that equipment, work with their individual constituents to say, yes, I need this access or I don't need that access. It's just a very complicated model pushing that all the way down to the end user department. As I said, they have large amounts of, of research money and it's just odd that they have to spend that money to manage the network in which they're operating when you have a core um, IT management group that could handle that work. 
Uh, and lastly, it was again, as Chris said earlier, trying to get some of the bad traffic off the network before it came in to our individual um, devices. So including not just antivirus, but also intrusion prevention. Um, so trying to get some of that bad traffic off before it comes through. As far as the, the IPS stuff too, I mean, there's, there's one thing to use uh, in some cases, you know, the reputation of, you know, bad servers, bad systems, bad IPs. Um, when, you, when you look at it from, from an overall campus perspective, um, you can in some cases look internally just to the machines that are on your network. So it's one thing to put a filter at the border and say, I don't want IPs from my network, from, from my two subnets or, or my two networks to talk to these IPs. So I'm gonna block those holistically at the, at the border. But <coughs> there are situations where you can have those internal to your network as well. So you can't just plop one device or one appliance at the border and say, okay, great, we're all protected because we, we live in a BYOD environment. People are coming to campus with whatever machines they just got off eBay, whatever machines you know, their kid had the weekend before out at the soccer field, and we can't control that. We can't say that just because you're on our campus network that you're not gonna layer two, you know, do something bad to your neighbor, or even layer three. So as soon as you've got uh, a machine on our network, we, we not only need to protect that from infecting other people, but we need to look at it the other way around too, that you're not being infected by people from outside campus. So uh, those are basically the approach. Um, and this is a, a high level di diagram essentially of what the network looks like. Um, so I'll kind of walk you through it because if you haven't had a degree in this, uh, it, it's uh, a bit uh, convoluted, but it actually makes a lot of sense once you see it. So. Uh, a, instead of having 42 VLANs kind of doing this, we went to a single firewall per building approach. So there's a, a building router and then the firewall right behind it. Um, and so each of these firewalls represents one of the four buildings. Uh, we did an HA for the one building because that's where our data center is. We wanted to make sure we had high availability there. The rest of them, we do have four hour on site for the stuff, you know, so we have good return, um, good exchange. We can keep hot spares. Um, most of our model for the network is a single device with hot spare for replacement. So we followed that same approach with the other buildings. Um, so then looking up and down vertically, that's a building and the network's inside of it. So we have three distinct classes of network within each building one for administration, one for instruction, and one for research. Uh, also known as one for people who are employed and work there, one for students, and one for the guys doing the faculty who are doing research. Um, and so the, keeping the, the types of traffic among each of those groups are very similar, um, and the types of rules that they'll require. So we wanted to group them logically. Um, but we're not separating them out, so they are layer two adjacent internally. So that's one network. And on each of these networks, uh, we're dual stacking IPv4 and IPv6. And in each firewall, we're including intrusion prevention, malware detection, antivirus um, coming in so for inbound and outbound traffic, as well as deploying application layer uh, rule sets across the stack. And so, and then we introduce identity with roles coming out of Active Directory to allow us to create dynamic policies saying, if you're a faculty member and you're in this group but you want to do BitTorrent, we're gonna allow that because faculty may have a, a legitimate need to do BitTorrent, to download applications or do file sharing with other peers. If you're a student and you somehow manage to get into that same network but you plug in your device and we know you're a student now, we're gonna turn off BitTorrent traffic because we don't want you sharing. And if for whatever reason you manage to do it, now we can track the DMCA violations. But we really don't want to allow that traffic through that network segment, so we're gonna turn it off. Um, so this model is basically what we built uh, from a core operations perspective with School of Engineering as a proof of concept, um, knowing that if we're going to deploy something like this at a campus-wide level, um, we needed to see if our concepts were sound, to see if what we thought as far as our goals and objectives were something that was attainable with the technology that's out there today. 
Um, so when we look at this model um, while it's representing School of Engineering, the way that that scales out to the entire campus is each individual building, um, it basically follows our regular um, network model on campus where we have uh, two core routers that are handling um, all of the IP routing from various areas. We break out a cluster of buildings into an, a logical area and then each individual building um, has its own router and then we found that to individual stack of um, individual distri distribution frames within the floors. So where the, the, the firewalls are depicted up here across the top, um, that would actually be a firewall per building. And when we look at the traffic patterns from department to department to department, it became very clear that people really aren't doing anything unique from a traffic and, and a pure IP perspective. Sure, what, what, what that IP traffic is doing may be unique to the research that that department is doing, but overall, when you step back and take a look at what's the actual traffic flow, where is it going, and how is it trying to get there, it doesn't matter whether you're in this department or that department the overall patterns are very, very similar. So when we look at this approach, we say, well, let's put a, an actual firewall at the building within that logical structure, allow people that need to have a publicly routable IP based on either VPN access or whatever reason, web servers and, and, and anything else that requires a publicly routable IP, give that to them, put them on a, on a network that supports public IP addressing, and then if you're not in that ball, or not in that, in that realm, then give them a private IP and let them live within that building, accessing their data server, accessing their web server, doing whatever it is they need to do, but on a private IP. So we start to regain some of that IPv4 space that, that we've exhausted. We've used the firewall as a, as a gateway, basically. If you want to get out to the internet, we, we, we nat you at that point, give you a public IP and send you on your way. When you look at the overall model, everybody that's going from building A to building B, regardless of what department that you're in, you, you basically become a layer three connection at that point. So we eliminate this whole notion of VLAN sprawl for the most part, and things like bridge loops are now contained within one logical building. They're not spread out across multiple campuses or multiple buildings within the campus. and as Jamie indicated, you tie in things like um, radius, you tie in things like your um, exchange environment. Um, the, the concept basically is as soon as your network is having to authenticate for whatever reason, we now know who you are. And so we can tie all that together from a holistic approach and say, yes, I know what building you're in, I know what device you're on, and I know what you're trying to access. And then if you should do something bad or your machine should do something unexpected, we know when you did that, and we can either uh, perform rule sets or actually provide data that says that this IP or this person did this activity or didn't. So from a DMCA and, and other malicious type activities, we have a very good visibility on what you actually did while you were on the network and what device you did it with. One of the, the nice things about this is um, we've tried to do too is we're grouping these networks logically together in one zone. So that's a zone with very similar traffic patterns to each other. And if a user moves from one building to the other, we don't have to create new rules. We can create one rule that says, allow web traffic out from this location to the world. That's one rule, bang, and it distributes out to all the firewalls across the stack. So it, the very common rules that are used across multiple devices, multiple buildings, we can build that rule one time and distribute it. The other thing we can do is, even above all of this, is another layer where we can write policies that block or allow globally. So it applies to all of the zones, all of the traffic. So if all of a sudden there's a, a really nasty threat that comes out and you know, um, things I'm thinking of like the SQL um, worms that happened a few years ago and all of a sudden, oh my gosh, we gotta block this traffic. You can create one rule, distribute it to every firewall in the entire organization, and you just block that traffic. Um, so it allows the central security, looking over the entire campus or the entire organization, the ability to have that kind of insight and power to respond very quickly. 
So I know the first question that comes to mind, at least most of the time that we give this presentation, is that doesn't sound simple, right? I mean, well, that was one of our goals, was this needs to have that simple button, right? Um, managing all of these people, managing all of these devices, managing identity, managing protocols, managing applications, where the heck does simple come into any of this? Well, it comes in the fact that we're not building this from the ground up. We're leveraging things that are, that are being used by multiple entities across the world. So things like reputation services, things um, like advanced firewalls that are most vendors, most of them actually are probably sitting right out here, um, have products that can be built to do most of it is that we want to do. It's a matter of how do you stitch that together and how do you layer that on top of your network in order to benefit from all of these silos of technology that are being you know, thrown at us from every angle. So the simple part comes in having a central overlay to all of those devices, whether they're from multiple vendors or the same vendor, that you can log in and see a holistic approach of your security posture. You can log in and see your, your, your IPS engine. You can log in and see who's trying to access your network at any given time from a remote SSL tunnel. You can log in and see um, what threats are being blocked automatically at your, at your firewall. From what country are they coming from? Um, so all of this is basically the single pane of glass perspective. If you want to take change and you want to say, look, this particular IP has 50,000 concurrent ports open right now and they're scanning the heck out of me, I want to block that IP because I'm not aware of anything that should be doing that. I can make one keystroke and lock down every single firewall from talking to that IP from one control machine. That control machine can be something that's remote. I could log in with my surface through an SSH tunnel and say, here's the control. Let me make that port change right now today. And I'm done. So the simplicity comes with one pane of glass, looking at all of these silos of, of technology that are stacked on top of each other, and also raising that, that control layer up one level, just like Jamie indicated. If you have a thousand departments that are out there all managing their own individual firewalls, it's very complicated. But if you boil that up to the top and you have one central group looking at the majority of that situation, the simplicity comes in, maybe not from the central perspective, but for sure from the departmental perspective. So that's the goal is really that we look at it as a holistic approach, knowing the work needs to get done, knowing that the objective still needs to get met, but where is the right place to do it, and what is the visibility that the departments then have access to? So um, I know everyone's probably sitting there saying, okay, great, what did you actually put together? Who's the vendor? What did you do? And we purposely left that out um, for well, one big reason. We don't know who the vendor's gonna be. You know, we did this as a pilot, as a proof of concept, to know that the technologies we were putting in place were sound and that this could work. But the reality is that the campus will be doing an RFP very shortly to right. select a vendor to do this for the entire campus. So um, that's really the reason we're not saying, okay, this is the vendor we're using right. and we're doing this and that, because the, the reality is that that could change. And we're not, we're not here to pitch a vendor, we're here to pitch a really a, a project a concept. plan, a concept, yeah. a proof of concept. And, and it's important to know that there, there's multiple vendors that are doing most of what we're talking about today. It's not, it, it really shouldn't be really the first time you're hearing about some of these things. But I think what we wanted to do is, again, portray where we were, the mess that we started with, the problems that that created, and what are we as one institution that's out there having to deal with this firsthand, what are we doing about it? And, and what's the approach that we're trying to take to make life simpler for the people that are actually doing the research and the, the, the instruction, um, as well as the IT professionals that, that they employ? And so we could probably go through a list depending on you know, whose network you're on and what vendor solutions that, that particular vendor has. But, but all that to say is that the goals and the, the, the expectations of this project can be pretty much applied across the board from, from a number of different vendors. Sure. So can you walk me through if I walk into one of these buildings, turn on Wi-Fi on my Android phone, mm -hmm. how am I granted or locked out of network resources? Yeah, so absolutely. So everybody hear the question, first of all? Yeah. 
Okay, so, so what happens is when you first log on the network, we're not going to do any sort of NAC or... Uh, okay, Android phone, yep. Uh, so we challenge you for a WPA yeah. Password. So most of our Wi-Fi on campus, unless you're doing, uh, we don't have open SSIDs. So you have to log on with some sort of one X authentication uh, to get on our primary SSID. Um, the other option is with, like, with a guest access account, in which case you have to log in in a guest access portal. So at that point, we know um, whether it's your campus credential or you're a guest coming to campus with somebody vouching for your identity. We know who you are to some degree. So from that point on, we can start um, making rules based on the access that, you, that you've been um, uh, trying to access. So let's use the example that you're just trying to get to the internet, you're trying to check your Google Mail account, okay? So, and, and that you're not a UC Davis person, say you're um, a parent of a student that's there. So you walk into campus, you see a guest wireless SSID, you click on it, um, you log in using some form of uh, email, SMS number, you know, whatever, um, and you gain access to the network. At that point, our wireless controller through its radius authentication mechanism will say, this person, John Doe, tried to access the guest wireless network, was given access based on the credentials that he was given or that he gave us, and from that point on, we have an IP address and a name. From there on out, we have an identity to tag your traffic to that identity. So let's just say you're trying to access Google, okay? The firewall from whatever network of the building that you're in is gonna say you're trying to access whatever, 8.8.8, .8 whatever, DNS. Um, so at that point, then the, the firewall says, okay, first of all, were you given, a, a more than likely if you're coming in on an Android, we're gonna give you a, a private IP to try to minimize uh, the, the exhaustion. So now that you're trying to reach an outside entity, we're going to NAT that into a publicly routable IP. So you're gonna get a public IP and a port, and you're gonna go out, and they're gonna open up a, a session between you and whatever the IP is of, of your destination. So, so you're, tracking, yep. you're tracking you by? Principally by your given IP. That's really the, the crux of all of this. Until you authenticate, so the, the Android's a really easy one for us because you have to authenticate to get on the network wirelessly. So let's, let's tweak that slightly and say, let's just say you plugged in in the library on a general, uh, you have your, your uh, laptop and you just plugged into a network connection in the basement of the library. That one becomes a little trickier because we don't do 1X on the wire. So at this point, you have a network connection, you can hit the outside world, but we haven't challenged you for anything. So I know you have an IP, I know you're trying to get to Google, but I don't know who you are. So that's the one that becomes the trickier one to battle. From there, we put you in a special role. Much, very, very similar to what we would have done in wireless. We put you into a guest role. Guest role, by default, says you don't have access to anything that's secure. So when we look at this model, you fall somewhere in the lines of an admin type role. Okay? Now, let's say maybe you aren't the, the parent of a student anymore. Maybe you're now a faculty, but you're on a device plugged into the same location, okay? Let's say you're trying to get to your campus email. As soon as you do that, you're gonna be prompted for your mail credentials. As soon as you type in those mail credentials, regardless of where you've been on the network up to that point, I can now associate your identity with that IP address that your machine's had this whole time and go back and say, okay, here's everything that that person wanted to do, and up to this point, he now has an identity. From there, you can start making your logical decisions based on that combination. <coughs> Does that make sense? We can pull um, Active Directory credentials. We can pull Radius credentials. You can, so if your machine's domain joined, domain joined, you can pull the, the logon session with the <coughs> controller to associate your username and your IP together. <coughs> you can pull uh, Radius logs to do the same thing. Um, you can, I think we have about six different sources of logged information that we can pull at this time to make that association with who you are. You'll reassociate. You'll have to rechallenge to get 802.1x credentials. So, rechallenge and get a new IP. So yes and no. Actually, that's a, that's not quite right. So with the way our campus wireless infrastructure, um, we pass credentials from controller to controller. So if you um, join the network in building A 
and you go to sleep, when you come up in building B, you're going to try to reuse the same IP that you were given in building A. The controller is going to say yes or no based on the availability of that IP, whether it's been handed out before or since you've been offline. At that point, if it doesn't know who you are, it's going to re your, your client is going to ask for a new IP, or the controller is going to say, no, here is a new IP. <clears throat> At that point, based on your cached uh, 1x credentials within your client, it's going to make that association with who you physically are. So even if it's a different IP, we can say up to this point, say noon on the money, that's when you put your machine to sleep. John Doe did all of this activity. At 12.15, I saw John Doe re-auth within the, the controller environment for wireless and was given now this new IP. And so all of that from here on out is on this other IP. So you have a gap of 15 minutes where we don't know where you are, but you also didn't have an IP at that time. Yeah. Yeah, go yeah, ahead, Jamie. My experience has been <laughs> log it for about a month and, and start to get a good snapshot of the type of traffic that's flowing through. And then build your policies that say allow this and build them hierarchically. So you say allow, 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 allow. And then the last one is log. Right. And not, not deny yet, but just keep logging. And when traffic then makes it to that last rule set and it's logging the traffic, then you create your next allow and do that for a month or two until you're pretty confident that the only thing that's hitting that allow is bad traffic and then implement the deny and keep logging. Sure, so essentially your, your, your policy is allow all out today. Yes. Maybe block five bad things that you don't want out. Um, and then log the, the default policy is allow all out then start building rules in between the deny and the allow, allow all out that catch the tr good traffic you want to allow. So you're reducing the log on that allow all so that at the end of the month, hopefully that allow all is either bad traffic or traffic you don't care about and then you can flip that to a deny. So that makes That's sense. the way I've done it in the past. So you're basically it's, building you know, a container. Successful. You're building a container to log right now stuff that you're not sure about. At some point, based on the rules that you put in place, the list of things that you're logging will become the actual things that you're going to end up denying. So without taking you know, a, a forceful approach and saying, I'm just going to deny it from the beginning, I'm just going to log it, keep an eye on it, and see what's happening. And, and as people... Um, move their traffic patterns, you're going to see that, that that list of stuff that you're logging becomes really the, the full set of things that you're going to end up denying. It looks like we have about five minutes or less left, so any other questions? Yeah. You mentioned that you Yeah, that's. Yep. Yeah, so that's that's been our Achilles heel of the university, and I think most public institutions for quite a while. Um, the notion of BYOD as a benchmark trades term um, really came out of university or, or education space. But for us, it's not BYOD, it's, it's the commonplace. That's how our network is. The reality is the machines that are corporately owned, so to speak, are the exception. Um, most cases, a client or, or a professional walks on campus, their onboarding process is not, here's your machine, and it's admin locked down. 
it's literally here's your budget buy the tools and stuff that you need and they go out and procure through whatever resources they're familiar with and the machine shows up then they take it to their IT guy and say make it work on the network <coughs> and so that machine goes off campus every night or you know goes on an airplane trip for a personal vacation or whatever I mean there is no span of control yeah they're often the uh, a good example is a faculty member will show up buy 10 computers on a grant <laughs> yeah. because they got grant money for them in their lab and all their, their graduate students. They get the computers, that computer's also the computer their kid uses to right. surf the internet and write their papers for school. Then that computer comes back onto campus and they do some research with it. Uh, it then get, you know, travels overseas and is used to capture data from a bunch of instrumentation for a bit then goes back to the kid's high school, then comes back onto campus. Well, the other thing so, is that you didn't add, and the faculty member could say, I don't want my IT staff to work at Oh, absolutely. Yeah, that's a very good point. Yeah, so, so as, Jamie, not allowed to touch as Jamie illustrated, this is their physical machine, and, and they consider, they, I say they, um, most faculty, especially the tenured faculty, look at IT as the enemy. They're not allies. They're not walking down the same path together. The, the IT guy is sitting there, you know, banging on the head of the professional instructor saying, you can't do this, you can't do that, I'm not going to open that port, you can't. So they're always negative, negative, negative. And so that's the approach that this professional instructor comes to us and says, no, you're not touching my machine. I just, I need a new battery, that's all. You just give me a new battery. So your point is very valid, is how do you, how do you keep the risk to the institution at a minimum, yet allow the flexibility for any device to come onto the network. And so the approach is, is, is we try to illustrate, is minimize the layer two adjacency. Most attacks happen at a layer two level. So the, the problem we have now with layer two is again, it spreads all over the place. So somebody sitting in the library that happens to get on a network that's in there that also spans out to some other facility now infected a machine that the person's you know, three miles from the library. So if we can contain that and say that, the, the, that these layer two segments only live within that physical geography of one building, we greatly reduce the layer two adjacency. And then as traffic goes from that one to that one or from this network to that network, then it's, inspected. it's flowing through the firewall and right. getting inspected. So we are, we're catching uh, malware, we're catching all those things exactly. as they flow through associated with an identity, hopefully. Yeah, so there, there is going to be an inherent risk to some degree. I mean, if, if you really wanted to break it down to a very granular level, you could say, well, I'm, I'm ultimately going to have a 24 or 48 port edge switch somewhere, period. I can't give everybody a direct connection off of my firewall. So I'm going to have a layer two presence at some degree somewhere in the network. The theory is, We've come from here, and, and, and this is where you're talking about you know, having full control and full visibility to every layer two segment. We're gonna try to aim for about the 80% rule. And, and for us, if we can get to there, we retire happy. <laughs> that's, a, that's a huge win for where we are currently, yeah. Anything else, maybe one more question? All right, so it sounds like this content is going to be, um, I think they said on YouTube at some point, um, and then the, the actual slide material and some of the verbiage will be up there as well. Thank, Thank you. you all. Thank you.